I hit points where my brain and my body are like, look, you can keep going. We're out. You know, my brain and my body are like, if you want to keep going without us, good luck with that. But we're not doing it anymore. So I would have to shut down. But ideally, you don't get to the point where your brain and your body are boycotting you. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. Are you thinking about making the flip to coaching? You might be excited about the liberation that expanding beyond private practice could bring you. Working from anywhere, working with folks from everywhere, breaking free from the limits of your therapy license if you have one, getting to create and serve in new ways. So if you're going to make this transition, should you make it quickly or slowly? When I was making that transition from a private practice to something else, I did it pretty slowly. It wasn't until about 2015 that I fully put myself into what is now Rebel Therapist. I still had a therapy practice at that point, but I was doing a lot in this business. In internet years, that was about six years ago. Six years is a long time on the internet. My guest this week, Dr. Linietta Willis, made the flip all at once. She had a thriving private practice, and for reasons you're going to hear in about 60 seconds, she decided to flip completely into coaching all at once. I am so excited to share Dr. Linietta with you. You're going to be taking notes, not just on how she's built her coaching business, but also on how she sets up her time and creates harmony between her business and the rest of her life. Here's a little more about her. Dr. Linietta Willis, psychologist and family empowerment coach, helps frustrated families break unhelpful patterns and cross-generational cycles so they can move from stable misery into peaceful harmony. She helps her clients and audiences learn to strengthen their parenting, partnership, and personal growth practices so they can feel harmony in their hearts and homes, and she's sometimes available for business coaching. Welcome, Linietta. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Me too. I have so much I want to ask you. Let's start with why did you decide to move over to coaching? Yeah, you know, it didn't start out as a conscious choice. I actually had a thriving private practice in the Atlanta area for a number of years. And I became pregnant with my second child, my daughter, and my husband got a job in, a, in another location. So I said, OK, I'll shut down my practice and then we'll move and, uh, and, then I'll start, and then I'll start my practice up again. And my daughter was about five when I was like, I don't think I want to start my practice again. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. Now I was doing things like um, I helped a nonprofit agency They worked with, they provided um, medical support for the uninsured and I helped them create a mental health division. So I was doing some therapy work there, but I just didn't start my practice. And then I talked to a girlfriend of mine who was like, yeah, I have something to say, but I'm I'm afraid you're going to judge me. And she's a therapist. And I'm like, what is it? What what did you do? You know, (laughs) what happened? You know? And Sleep with a client, like what's going on? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what's going on? And she's like, "I'm t- I'm moving from therapy to coaching." And I was like, "Tell me more. What does that even mean?" You know. And I got it because there is sort of a there can be a tension between the therapy world and the coaching world a little bit. But I was really excited, and so I uh, joined. I went in and got the training that she did, and started seeing people. And it, I just, it just felt so much better. And I realized I really enjoy it. I can see people from all over the world. I did, um, uh, one of my specialties used to be trauma. And I realized that it's very, though it's very rewarding. It also can be very exhausting. So while I'm still trauma informed, I don't do a lot of the, you know, direct trauma work of course, in coaching now. And, and I just, I, I love it. I really, really enjoy it. And I get to do it from home, which is, has its ups and downs to that, but we'll talk about that later. But yeah. <laughs> And if you ever move, 
your coaching business is not impacted. Like it does, I mean, everything's impacted by a move, but the business doesn't change. 100%. It was so interesting to me after I moved, I had clients who, um, and I started the coaching business clients who found me again from when I, when they were, they were like, can I come and do coaching work with you now? And I'm like, sure. You know? And so it really is a, a beautiful ability to be able to say like, this is mobile. You know, and like I, my practice really was thriving. And and even if it wasn't central to that location, I still would have shifted a lot, but it still would have been nice to not have to start all over from scratch with this. But um, the benefit of being able to do that was it was sort of this clean slate, you know, and being able to redefine myself, which, which in, in many ways was important and a lot of fun. So I regret nothing with regards to that. Mm. And so you made you made this change. You weren't running both at the same time. You made this change with a clean slate. And I'm wondering, I work with a lot of people who are doing both. And so I can see so many answers to this question. But do you see advantages to having gotten to start with a clean slate and getting to create it just without any other business entity going on? Yeah, you know, I I can see advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of it was that I really was able to just redefine myself as a coach. And it really and and from a legal ethical perspective, there wasn't the confusion, you know, of oh, well, this is my therapy part and this is my coaching part, right? Like it was just all I'm doing is coaching, you know, so I didn't have to try to wrestle with, wait, okay, what's therapy? And then what's coaching? And how do I differentiate myself? And, you know, to make sure that it's, you know, in the separate websites, and I didn't have to go through all those questions. It was just a matter of like, this is all I'm doing now. So it really took a lot of that pressure off. I will say that I am privileged in the fact that my household was is not dependent upon my income. So a lot of people can't make that switch. If, if you know, their household is dependent on their income, they just can't say, oh, I'm just going to stop and start off something new, you know? So the benefit is, you know, you can still have an income while you're moving. The other benefit of transitioning, um, I have a friend who, the friend that I, that introduced me, she's transitioning. She's a single woman. So it's, it's her. And I feel as if she when it came to really sort of nailing her niche, she was a little bit more, um, she was so, she was still close to the field and it was easier for her to do that because she was like, okay, looking at what I do over here, what aspects of it do I like? What aspects of it can I transport? The downside though was where she did struggle a little bit was making the jump. You know, because now it's like, okay, well, now I have to inform my clients and my prices are going to shift and now I'm doing these packages and right. So it was, it was a little bit more nuanced for her because now she has to communicate to people. I'm doing something a little different, communicate to referral sources. I'm doing something a little different, you know, so I can see ups and downs to it either way. Um, for me, it was helpful to to do the the clean slate thing. I had to really get back into my head around like, what do I want to do? What do I enjoy? You know, like how do I move in this direction? You know, so there was a lot of that going on. Yes, but yeah, so I can see it pros and cons either way. Well, I love that, and also that you have this case study of your close friend to say like. Yeah, I see in action the pros and cons of, yeah. of both situations. I'm definitely the, the, I did the transition as well, the slower transition as well. And I'm also, yeah, the breadwinner in my family. And so, yes, although my wife is definitely nipping at my heels with her business now. So that's awesome. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so will you tell us about stable misery? Yes, yes. So a lot of what I do is, so I identify as a family empowerment coach. Now I'm trained as a psychologist, but um, identify as a family empowerment coach. And stable misery is a phrase I've used for almost, for like I've been in the field for over 20 years and almost the entire time I'm here. And it's just one of those phrases that people get. 
And it's that place where people hit in their life where things are moving along, they're going, there might not be anything emergently wrong, like crisis type of things, but where they are in their life, they find themselves um, just not happy, unfulfilled, uh, miserable. And where I see this most often in my work with people is in their parenting and in their partnerships. So they'll have stable misery marriages or stable misery parent you know, relationships with their kids where they're just not happy. They're having the same fights again and again. Um, they're overwhelmed. They're avoiding things. Right. So it's these same patterns and habits repeating themselves over and over again. And nobody's happy. Right. But you just keep going off like sheer inertia. Right. So it's stable um, in that things are moving along, but it's miserable and that you're not happy. And it can really just lead to an overall sense of like, God, is this all there is? Do I really want to live my life like this? What can I change? And people in stable misery often do things to try to pull themselves out. But it's like a it's like a slippery mud pit, you know. You get a little bit up and then slide right back down again. And so, a lot of the people that I work with, I find myself find themselves in that space. I work with a lot of business owners and professionals, in particular. And what I often see with them is they're in situations where they're what I like to say um, their business becomes their mistress. Right. Where, you know, there are three things that we often crave in life and more than three, but especially three. Um, we have a sense we like have this we crave a sense of joy and satisfaction, a sense of control and a sense of confidence. And when we're in a stable misery marriage or a stable misery parenthood situation, what can often happen is we're not happy. There's no joy there. So we tend to gravitate towards things that, that bring us joy. I mean, that's just a natural evolutionary thing, right? It's what kept us alive for all those millions of years. You don't eat the fruit that makes you throw up. You eat the fruit that fills you up and tastes good. Like it's a natural thing to go towards things that you enjoy, that you crave. So when you can't get that, that sense of joy and satisfaction in your marriage or in your relationship with your child, there can be this tendency to go towards your business or your career and rely on that. Um, same thing with control. You know, I can't control my kids, but I can make this freebie or I can update my website or I can, you know, update my profile so I can get more clients. Right. So. Ooh, and do you feel like when you see that happening, do you think people sometimes do, oh, <laughs> kind of stupid stuff in their businesses instead of like the really impactful stuff? Oh, yeah. And and what I often see is they wheel spin, right? Yes. So they'll just do the things that, that, that feel good, which is the next C, confidence. I'm going to do the things that make me feel competent because when we're in stable, when we're living in stable misery, we often feel anything but competent, right? Like I'm not a good mom. But or I'm not a good wife or I'm not a good husband or good whatever, fill in the blank. But I can, you know, build a website like nobody's business or I can rework my contracts or, you know, and then we do these things and we put our time and energy and effort into things that aren't there aren't really a risk for us that are really easy and don't really move us forward, but keep us feeling good, keep us feeling in control, keep us feeling confident, keep us feeling um, satisfied in some way. And that that's hard. And I get it. I mean, the business doesn't talk back. It doesn't shut down. It doesn't walk away. It doesn't, you know, all these things that tend to happen in our most sacred relationships, our business is like, I got you. I'm always here for you. And the way we keep that in line is we focus on those things that, that will help us keep it in that feel good situation. But the downside of that is it could become a frenemy type of situation at the same time, right? And our business becomes our frenemy in that it feels really good and it's really we feel really competent and in control and satisfied. But then our family life is deteriorating. Right. And the more we focus on the business and ignore 
the stable misery mess that's over here, then the more the business becomes just a crutch that we rely on. And the more that the things that really matter to us most, our relationships with the people that we care about, they start to fall away. And that can invite things in like regret and shame and overwhelm and, you know, all of these different things and thrust us deeper and deeper into that pit. So really getting in a space where one can, yes, use that business. You should feel good about your business 100%, but also balancing that with directly addressing the things in one's personal life that's keeping them in stable misery is also really key, whether it be with another, with a, with a professional or coach or, you know, with your, with yourself. Like one of the things that I have, I have a, roadmap that I created that people can use to actually help them start to um, release themselves from the stable misery pit. Like one thing I've implemented this year, which I'm very happy about is I take flex weeks now, you know, where at the end of the month, I take a week, I don't see clients. Now I might do an interview or wrap up some things, but I realized how important it is for me to just have that white space period where, yes, I can wrap some things up or I can stare at a wall, (laughs) whatever I need to do just to allow myself to rejuvenate and really plug into other areas of my life that are super important and reflect on like, well, how did this month go? Anything I want to change, anything, you know, how do anything I want to do differently? Do I feel like I was giving enough time? to the kids and to my husband, right? It's like, you have to have time to stop for a minute and reflect or else what ends up happening is when you're burnt out laying on the side of the road somewhere, metaphorically, please, (laughs) you know, then you're looking up like, oh, maybe I should have done things a little differently, right? But now you're too exhausted to do anything about it, right? So you have to build in that white space and you have to build in that time for the things that really matter to you. Yeah, one of my best friends, just took a month off of work and then noticed as she was coming back in that on her weekends, she was just having weekends. She wasn't at an energy deficit anymore of kind of, of being burnt out, like because she had really taken the amount of time off that she needed. Now she can be in harmony throughout the week. We'll get into a recent time when Dr. Linietta got out of harmony, and you'll also hear a lot more about how she runs her business. First, if you're ready to create a business beyond private practice, using your skills and your experience as a healer or therapist, your biggest problem might be that you don't know where the hell to start. I know that was my problem when I was ready to expand. I had too many ideas and not enough clarity. It is my strong opinion, based on working with a lot of therapists and healers, that the best way to start is to create a simple pilot program for a particular group of people and to develop a simple marketing system to get the word out to those people. I know that sounds simple, and it is, but it's not necessarily easy. I can help you do all of this in Create Your Program. You'll work with me and a group of badass, progressive therapists and healers to get it done together. Head over to rebeltherapist.me slash create. Learn much more about how it works and apply. Okay, now we'll jump back in with Dr. Linietta as she talks about her own experience with what she calls stable misery. The reason why I am able to focus on stable misery is because I've had a stable misery marriage. I've, I've had a stable misery mommyhood, right? I've been there, you know, and I know what it feels like. And so it's one of those things where really being able to tap into where I am energy wise and do something about it, right? Like I realized last week, I did a launch of um, one of my signature programs, Triggered to Transformed, and I did a five day challenge on the front and it was great. And I had so much fun with it. At the end of it, I was drained. Like it took me literally a week and a half before I started feeling like myself again. And there was a time in my life where I wouldn't have recognized that. I would have been like, 
um, maybe I just need to drink more water. Maybe I just need to, you know, but I've really gotten much better at focusing on my body and, and really checking in with what I need and my energy level. Because when you work for an organization, like you do so much and then you go home at the end of the day, when you work for yourself and you're building something for yourself or for your legacy or for your livelihood, it really does. You can go forever. Right? Like You can literally if you wanted to. But I hit points where my brain and my body are like, look, you can keep going. We're out. <laughs> my brain and my body are like, if you want to keep going without us, good luck with that. But we're not doing it anymore. So I would have to shut down. But ideally, you don't get to the point where your brain and your body are boycotting you. Will you tell me about your business model, the combination of services that you offer? Yeah. So when I first started, it was, it was just one-on-one. You know, and I got, I was really focusing on, you know, trying to really hone in where, where, what do I enjoy? What do I want to do? Um, and then I started to hear some of the same things over and over again, um, which is what led me to create the past model. <laughs> and I was answering the same questions over and over again. And I, I started to realize, like, I can talk to a lot of people at once with this rather than just keep repeating myself over and over. So then I started the Trigger to Transformed program, which um, is specifically for parents who wrestle with triggers or dance with triggers, like I like to say. And I basically walk them through the paths model. Um, and, and through that process, they transform their triggers and, and their relationships with themselves and their kids. And I also still do one-on-one. And I, um, I, do, I have a package called Harmony in the Home, which I work with parents and or couples and some individuals with that, you know, if they're having relationship struggles. Um, it's actually a really cool package because I, it allows me to work with many different dynamics within the family. So sometimes I'll get one person in the family who's like, I want to change me. Sometimes I'll get, I've been getting a lot of mother daughter duos late, lately, which is a lot of fun. Ooh, that's rich. <laughs> yes. Yes. A lot of mother daughter duos who really want to work on their relationship. I've really been enjoying that. And some parents and then couples, which I love, I love working, love coaching couples too. And And so I do the one-on-one, but I also have the group. And my hope is to move towards more of the group so that I can serve more people. Yes. So at this point, what do you think your percentages are about in terms of like how much one-on-one compared to group? So one-on-one definitely takes up a majority of the time just because I I have quite a few one-on-one clients. Um, The group is... One day a week, it's every Thursday from 3 to 4.30 Eastern, 3 to 4.30 when I'm teaching a masterclass and then 3 to 4 if I'm doing like question and answer. Um, and I rotate that every week. And then um, and then sometimes people will send me emails and things like that with questions and I'll upload articles and stuff like that. So the group actually takes less time to really implement uh, because I only show up once a week live for whoever's listening, you know, and then the rest of it is helping them to implement. So the majority is still the one-on-one. I would like at some point to flip that where a majority is the group and focusing on that. And I don't know, maybe do like memberships or something like that at some point. Well, and the beauty of that too, I know you already know this, but for anyone listening who didn't think this part through yet is like, you don't necessarily need to flip the time in terms of working as many hours with a group or a membership program. So it's like the revenue and the impact can flip without quite as many hours. Exactly. Exactly. Now, everybody I hear that runs, especially membership, say it's a lot. You still do. To do it well, it's still work. But I I also get the impression that once you get in the groove and you know how to do it, um, it, it becomes more automatic, right? But it's not something, and I see a lot of people doing this. Um, I have a lot of coaches who will ask me for advice and things like this. And what I see them wanting to do, and I don't, this isn't a bad thing. There's a lot of marketing out there now that's like, create a course with no list, create a membership with no list, you know, and you don't have to know anybody or be connected with anything. And you could, and it's like, sure, you can create it, but you can't sell it. 
Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you, know, you can create it, but you won't fill it, right? So there's like a lot of things that need to go into place before you can just start doing that sort of thing. And, and I was one of those people. I will, ugh, when I first started, I hate to say this, but I paid like three grand for a how to build a course program. And that thing is still sitting there collecting dust because it wasn't time. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't appropriate, you know? And so realizing that it takes, it takes time and there's, there's a process that needs to happen before you can really start doing the bigger things, right? Like it seems bright and shiny and beautiful and wonderful and a great idea, but to do it well and to, and to be successful and for it to fill that competence bucket, (laughs) And that control bucket, you know, it, it, you, you have to be um, mindful. Absolutely. Yeah. How, if you remember, like how big was your email list before you moved into having a group? That's a good question. Probably about, mm, okay. So the reason why that question isn't super easy to answer because what I did first was I had like mini groups. So I would do like tiny little four week dealios just to test out what do people want? What are people, you know, that sort of thing. So I would say when I started moving in there, I probably maybe had like maybe two to 3000 on the list at that time. And things like getting on podcasts or guest blogging or, you know, things like that are helpful too. You don't have to have a massive list, you know, to start a coaching business. You just have to have a way to funnel people in, to get eyes on you, you know, and people to hear you and understand. I have friends who have no list at all and they are doing really well, but they work with like corporations and organizations and they coach in that platform. So it comes from another way. So you just have to have a way to get people to see you. Yes. You know, and move in order to build. How do people tend to find you now? Yeah. So interviews, I get a lot of uh, people like signing up for calls and things like that on interviews from interviews. Um, I do, um, like the little things I do on social media, like when I did the coaching, the challenge before I launched the last trigger to transformed, you know, a lot of people wanted to, a lot, but like people, you know, signed up for discovery calls to see like, what would it be like to work one-on-one with you or to learn more about it? Um, that was my first dive into Facebook ads. <laughs> which oh, was, how did it go? No, <laughs> that was a learning curve for the age. Oh my gosh. But I will say I understand it now. It's funny. It's something that I would not see myself doing myself like long term. Like I would absolutely hire somebody else to do that for me at some point. But I'm the type of person where I want to learn how to do it first. And once I get it, That way, when the person's talking to me about conversions and all this, I'm not like, what? You know, so it was a lot of work. It did bring people in, right? I mean, it did. It got people in the group and signed up and um, engaged with it, um, which was great. But yeah, it's, 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 it takes time. It takes time. It's a lot. I love what you're saying, though. I really agree uh, that, I mean, I guess not everybody would want to do this. But I I did it the same way of getting in there myself. I actually did uh, Claire Pelletro's self-led course mm. to learn how to do it. And before that, I had hired someone else to do it for me. And I don't even count that because it went so badly. <laughs> <laughs> but now, <laughs> yeah, let's just, let's just like, besides telling you and whoever's <laughs> listening, let's just forget that happened. Right. But like... <laughs> But now that I understand it, it would go so differently. I always tell people, and I wonder if you agree with this, I always tell people, don't run Facebook ads, either yourself or hiring someone, until you already know your business is working, and then it can give it a bit of a motor. But if you try throwing money at Facebook ads at the very beginning, just say goodbye to your money. 100% (laughs) accurate. Like you need to know that what you have is what people want to buy. Like in that, and that it's interesting. And like, 
you and and once because when you don't know that you're trying to test so many different things so you're already wondering like is the copy okay? Does the picture make sense? Is the, like all this stuff. And now if you don't even know if it's something people want or if it's a viable option, now you have to question that. Well, maybe the offer isn't good, you know? So, you know, like, okay, people, like before the, I ran Trigger to Transformed a couple times and then I, d- I ran it again at, with Facebook ads because I knew, I knew the language. I knew what people, I knew people wanted it. I knew what, and you don't have to know like the exact outcome that everybody's going to get. You have to know that, but you at least need to know that it's a viable product <laughs> before you start running or else, yeah, you're just going to throw money into the wind. Same with those little micro offers everybody's creating now, you know, it's like, yeah, they can be self-liquidating and that they can pay for them. They can pay for your ads if people buy them, <laughs> yeah, you can put a $37 product out there, but you know, people need to want to buy it, you know? So absolutely. You have to make sure that you're, that you have something viable and that it makes sense before Facebook ads or else you're right. You're just, you're just giving good old Mark Z over there, you know, another <laughs> Lamborghini or whatever it is he's into. <laughs> absolutely. So how, how would you say there may be no typical day, especially in 2021, but how would you say that you spend a typical day? And I always am particularly curious about morning rituals, anything that helps you tap into joy or gets you focused. That is such a good question. And I wish I had some like really deep philosophical answer, like, oh, I get up and I listen to gongs and (laughs) set my intention for the day. That would be beautiful. Um, or totally wrong for you. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> That actually sounds great, but yeah, no, that's not what happens. Um, and I think part of it, so what I, I love to swim. And so three days a week, I actually wake up at five 30 in the morning and I go swim. Yes. And I have to get there before my frontal lobe kicks fully on and realizes what I'm doing. Like, yes, I'm getting up out of the warm bed to go jump in a cold bucket of water. That's exactly what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but I do it and and I like it, right? So on those days, that's a great start to my morning because swim is so meditative for me and it's it gets me working out and gets my body moving, which is great. Um, on the days where I don't do that, I have an amazing partner who allows me to sleep in and takes and gets the kids up and ready. And then um, I'll get up and then I'll take the kids to school. And if they if they go if it's a day when they go to school, they don't go to school every day. Um, or I'll get them started. But I find a lot of my morning is like them. I'm not a morning person, so despite my 5.30 a.m. obsession, <laughs> I'm not. So when it comes to rituals for me, I'm more likely to do an evening ritual than I am to do a morning ritual because the idea, like I've tried the morning meditation, I fall back to sleep. That's really what happens. I go right back to sleep again. So um, yeah, but evenings, like I love to go and meditate and, and just sit and think about the day. Um, think about, I always look at, okay, look at my calendar, see what's happening the next day, kind of look at my most recent to-do list where you get like a, just a basic sketch in my mind about where things are going to fit in the next day. So I do do a lot of that at night. Um, and then during the day, my day varies, which I actually like. I've, I've recently switched it where Mondays are discovery call, like new people only on Mondays. They used to be all over the place. But I had a coach once tell me that like your day will, you, your brain will feel so much better if you just do one day for that. And I was like, please, when I was in private practice, it didn't matter who walked through the door and what they wanted. New client, old client, didn't matter. I can handle it. And now that I've done that, I'm like, this is so much better. Um, I see um, new people on Mondays. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays are clients in groups. And then Fridays are just sort of like my refresh day, wrap up day, that sort of thing. Um, And so every day really does look different in terms of who I'm seeing and what I'm doing um, and that sort of thing, which again, I like that. I like the mix. I love doing it that way too. I love having theme days and like 
don't you love like waking up and knowing like today's Thursday. And so knowing like it's Thursday, like Thursday has its quality and it needs like a certain me to show up at it. And it's just like kind of predictable. Yes, yes, I love it so much, and and it it does because you you it takes a certain and my coach friend said this and I was like Meh, whatever so like it takes a certain mindset when you're talking to someone new about your programs versus when you're coaching people, and I found now that I've moved it in that way I found that to be very true, I found that to be very very true, and so when I'm when I'm seeing new people right after a coaching session I plan I I tend to more be coach more the new people as opposed to learning about them and, and, you know, thinking, okay, what would be best for them and in terms of what I can help them with. And, and then at the end, I'm like, Oh, I just gave you a coaching session, but you have absolutely no idea who I am, how I do, you know? So it it really helps to, I think, separate those two and get yourself in the mindset or all of the things, separate all the things and get yourself into a clear mindset about, what you're doing on a particular day and what parts of you need to be activated and show up and present for that particular day. Oh, I love that. So what are you excited about? Oh man, that is such a good question. I am excited about traveling. (laughs) I'm excited about getting back out into the world. Where do you want to go? Oh, so for spring break next week, we're actually going on an RV trip, which whenever I say that to my friends, they're like, but you're black. I'm like, you know what? Stop it. Um, it's like, <laughs> I just say it to my family and they're like, black people don't RV. I'm like, yes, we do. Stop saying that. Um, but we're going like on an, I want to buy an RV one day or like an RV trailer and like just go places all around the country and that would be really, really fun for me. Oh my god! So I'm really, really excited about doing this and just seeing how we, how we like it, or you know what it's like for us. Wow! How like so? You're renting one? Yes, we're gonna rent an RV. How yeah. many of you in what size RV? I've never done this before, so I'm. Yeah, really so there's four of us plus a cat. We got a kitten. We're we got a pandemic pet. And so it's new. So we're like, we really want to leave it at home. So that's going to be another added. But um, so there's four of us, my husband, myself, two kids, the cat. And it's like a 20 footer. It's a trailer. So it's not one that actually has the engine. We're going to borrow my husband's dad's truck and hitch it onto that and then drive it, which in terms, I wanted to do what I would probably buy. Right. So I was like, Probably wouldn't buy an R because that's just another car we have to take care of. But uh, but buying like a trailer that you just hook onto something that makes a little bit more sense to me. So we're buying it or we're renting it in with the mindset of like hmm, maybe this will be something that we could. You know, it's got like bunk beds and a full bed and a tiny little kitchen in it. And so I'm like, this is gonna be so much fun! I can't wait. <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm excited. Super yeah. Excited. But in terms of, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm like, well, back to me. I'm really <laughs> living vicariously through you about this. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> I'm like, Annie, don't do it. Don't go into the light, Carol Ann. Or yes, best thing ever. <laughs> but um, in terms of my business, I'm really excited about producing more. I'm, I'm in a space now where I'm really committed to like producing more content for the people that are following me and really strengthening the trigger to transform program in the process of running it right now. The next round starts in August. Um, And so I'm already thinking of ways to make it even better and more accessible and easier for parents to really digest and shift. Cause my basic gist is that, You know, you can read all the books you want. If you're in a triggered space, like you're not going to remember any of that stuff because your frontal lobe where all that stuff is stored is broken, is not there, right? So I do a lot of integration with like hypnotic meditations and different ways to really just access those important, those parts of ourselves and heal. That's basically what the PATHS model is. It's a way to harmonize those really those parts of ourselves and our life that need to be harmonized in order for us to show up how we want to show up in any of our relationships or for ourselves. So um, 
if folks go to healingstablemisery.com, they can actually download the paths model and it's got like specifics of how to use it to free yourself from stable misery and with each single one. And what I tell people is this, you're going to download it and you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, oh, I can do all of these. Don't do all the things (laughs) with business. This transfers to business too. Don't do all the things. Just pick one thing that resonates with you most and do it for a week and then see how it goes. Then pick another thing that resonates with you most do it for a week and you can apply it to your kids or to your partner or whatever. Um, and really just do it for a week, see how it goes and then move on to the next thing. And that would be my advice for business too. I try to do, I'm going to make a course. I'm going to use, I'm going to do the, the, And then it's like, I feel like a dog chasing cars, you know, like, oh, there's another car. Oh, there's another car, you know, and then nothing gets done. <laughs> yeah. Pick one thing. Yes. Yes. I love it. One day. I love it. (laughs) So I am so grateful. Thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, this was so much fun. Thank you for having me. Now I'll loop back and share some takeaways that particularly stand out to me from this conversation. Takeaway number one, consider building downtime into the rhythm of your business rather than waiting to burn out and then take downtime. Look at how you can take time off and build that into the structure of how you do things. Dr. Linietta takes a flex week at the end of every month. Like one thing I've implemented this year, which I'm very happy about, is I take flex weeks now, you know, where at the end of the month, I take a week. I don't see clients. Takeaway number two, do your rituals when they work for you. Don't worry about what self-care is supposed to look like. Dr. Linietta is not a morning person, although maybe that we could debate that a little bit with those 5.30 swim sessions, but a lot of her rituals happen in the evenings. Pay attention to your body's natural preferences when you're setting up your life. I'm not a morning person, so despite my 5.30 a.m. obsession, <laughs> I'm not. So when it comes to rituals for me, I'm more likely to do an evening ritual than I am to do a morning ritual. Takeaway number three. Theme days are amazing. Dr. Linietta does her consult calls on Mondays. She's got a particular shape to every day of the week, and that helps her to focus and bring the needed parts of herself to each day. If you haven't tried theme days, I highly recommend giving them a try, especially if you're trying to accomplish something new. You separate all the things and get yourself into a clear mindset about what you're doing on a particular day and what parts of you need to be activated and show up and present for that particular day. Those are three of my favorite takeaways from this conversation. What stood out to you? Send me an email at info at coachingwithannie.com. Even better, include a voice memo so I can share your voice on the pod. Tell me what stood out to you from this conversation and what it's helping you rethink in your own business. Here's a listener on Elise talking about their reaction to episode 150 featuring energy healer Stacy Bowden. It really helped me find language for something that I'd been privately intuiting on my own in my in my own business endeavors over the past couple of years and it was just wonderful to hear that validated and to know that I'm not completely out of my mind. <laughs> Um, so I really appreciate you and I appreciate the podcast so much and, um, thank you again. And thank you to Stacy for her beautiful work. I was really, really inspired by hearing what she had to say about what she does and by her authenticity and honoring who she is at a deep level in the way that she shows up in her business and in the world. You can find out more about Dr. Linietta Willis at healingstablemisery.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms for editing this podcast. If you found this conversation supportive, please share it with your favorite therapist or healer. That's how we reach more people. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you next time. Hey, can you guys be quiet? Just for a couple minutes.